Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth-generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation, so sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Everybody. Today's topic is don't save it, just sew it. And this came to me from a friend. Uh, she and I were talking about all the fabric we have, which is quite a lot. She has a lot. I have a lot. And um, we were talking about why we end up holding on to all this fabric and what that and like what the point of holding on to it is. And I think that there's a lot of reasons that I know I hold on to fabric. I develop attachments to it. Like when I remember when I bought this, or I remember when I um, was, was, was given this. Um, I have actually some fabrics in my stash that are from my grandmother and they are like Disney prints from 1973 or 1976 when all the characters look really different. And so I'm like, this is historical. I certainly can't. I can't use this. This is from my grandmother. I need to hold on to this forever. And um, so I haven't used anything with that. But for the other things that I have, things that I bought myself eight years ago or 10 years ago or 12 years ago or 11 years ago or five years ago, all of these are fabrics that represented something that I thought I was going to do when I bought it at the time. So we were talking about this and about what it means to hold on to special fabrics. And then she just said, don't save it, just sew it. And it was such a beautiful phrase and so simple. And it really did inspire me to start using some of the stuff that I had. So I wanted to talk today about don't save it, just sew it, and using rare fabrics and using fabrics that are rare or precious, but also using them in such a way that preserves them or allows you to really enjoy them. And that was something that I came to understand in my own process was that the fabrics as I had them in a drawer folded very neatly and very beautifully with my fabric stash cards that I have, my wonderful index of cards um, with fabric swatches and intentions for the fabrics and the measurements. And when I bought them, I keep that in my, um, it's like a card catalog for fabrics that I've created, but it's not doing anything, just sitting there. And so I can't talk about this in the context of Marie Kondo's um, Sparking Joy because I started the book but didn't finish it, and I have yet to see the show on Netflix. But from what I gather is that Sparking Joy is one of the... um, one of the paradigms or one of the triggers for deciding should you keep something or not keep it. And so, and again, this was just a terrible, I I, I am embarrassed to even admit this, like to even kind of quote the work that she's doing, because I think the work that she's doing is very particular and very helpful to many people. But I haven't, like, I don't know enough about it to talk about it intelligently. But my only um, understanding is from that spark joy. And so I'm just going to go with that. And I was thinking about ways that I could use fabrics that I have that would still spark joy, allow me to use them, and then release the rest of the fabrics. And that's something I know I've mentioned in um, previous episodes. We had these limited edition fabric boxes. These are fabrics that um, that I bought and really loved, but haven't done anything with. So I have them, you know, boxed up to um, be um, dispersed to people on a donation basis, you know, kind of thing. But I did want to talk about um, don't save it, just sew it. And to talk about this in the context of what it means to be deliberate in our sewing practice. What does it mean to kind of think through all of the um, emotional and psychological issues that sometimes get bound up when, when we buy something? I think this is one of the reasons that I have a very difficult time getting rid of the clothes that I make because I remember 
buying this fabric. I remember going to the store and getting it. I remember all the hours that it took to make this garment. And sure, I haven't worn it in eight years, but that doesn't mean anything, does it? It absolutely does. It absolutely means that I'm not wearing anymore and it's time for someone else to enjoy the use of it. So I think coming down from the holidays where I spent a lot of time with my sisters purging my closet and doing all of that, it also made me think about my fabric collection as well. And so this is why I wanted to share with y'all some ideas about don't save it, just sew it. And so I wanted to get started talking about a really great challenge that I've noticed um, on the um, um, Alethea Hudson. She was on an episode a few months back and her group, uh, So Much Talent on Facebook is a really big Facebook group. And she has a challenge every month for the year 2020. And this year's challenge, I'm sorry, this month's challenge is a stash reduction challenge. And it's called Stashed Gems. G-E-M, like stash gems. And I really liked it because it's um, really about finding um, the hidden gems of fabrics and patterns in the stash that you already have um, and thinking very deliberately about, you know, how do you choose and select what to keep and what to use. And it has a long list of rules. Now, you can always go to the Facebook group, Alethea's Facebook group, again, So Much Talent, S-E-W, Much Talent on Facebook, and you can see some of these rules. But I will just share a few of them with you now and to share that I myself have had a bit of success in this area. So the rules are no buying patterns, no buying fabric, 80% of your project has to come from fabric in your stash. 20% of purchases can be for additional patterns and fabric, not not patterns, but fabric and notions. Um, You cannot download new PDF patterns. You have to um, sew the garments during the time of the challenge. And I mean, so just those kind of rules. And so now... I was under the impression that I had not gone to Joanne Fabrics in the month of January. I was quite proud of myself. I was like, oh, I have not been to Joanne's. This is really fantastic. And then I happened to look down on the floor where there was a bag full of stuff from Joanne Fabrics that I had purchased. And a lot of this was like notebooks and clearance stuff that they had, but also I'd bought, I'd bought some buttons which I needed, but it was just so funny. I was like, oh my goodness, I go to Joanne so often that I don't even remember going there. I had completely convinced myself that I had not been to Joanne's when I had absolutely been to Joanne's. But that's not the victory I want to share with you today. The victory I want to share with you today is that there was, I was invited to a party and the theme was denim and diamonds. Now, I have very few diamonds, as in one on my wedding ring. So I don't have the capacity to wear like a whole lot of diamonds to this diamond and denim party, but I got a ton of denim, so much denim. And so I decided to pull out some of the denim that I'd bought a couple years ago. I believe I bought some checkerboard multicolored squared denim from Joann's. This was like a patchwork type denim where the squares alternated in color, like light and dark and light and dark at a regular pattern. And I bought three, maybe three or four yards of it in two separate pieces. Um, And I'm not sure why that happens. I think it's because I liked it and then I bought it and then I liked it. I saw it again and bought it again because I still liked it. And then by the end, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I have three of these. And two of them were in regular patterns and one was in an irregular one. And so I was able to take this pattern as well as another scrap piece of fabric and make um, a party dress out of denim. It was a McCall's pattern that I already had. And it was this off the shoulder. I think I could post a picture of it. It was an off the shoulder dress with a ruffle. And the ruffle was a piece of fabric that I had saved in my collection of neatly folded like fat quarter size fabrics. So some of them are a little bit small, a little bit bigger than a fat quarter, but I fold all my apparel fabrics into a four inch wide square and then I stack them or very neatly layer them into these drawers so that I can look at all of them at the same time. And I just happened to pull out this denim one that was sparkly on one side and regular dark denim on the other. And so 
it was really exciting because I used that same fabric to make my husband a 1968 vintage bell bottom wide collar suit for like a Halloween costume from years ago, years ago. And I just happened to have that scrap of fabric and I was like, I'm going to use this now. And so I was able to use it all up finally after all these years. And our outfits were able to match because the ruffle on my dress was the same as some of the fabrics in his bell bottoms. And I was able to make this outfit using something that I already had. Now, I kept thinking, like, why are you saving this fabric? This fabric is really nice. I really like it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I had planned, actually, to make a Zadie jumpsuit. I'm not really a big jumpsuit fan, but my friends have really converted me into jumpsuits. Uh, Jumpsuits, how about this is the thing. I like jumpsuits, but my bladder is a hater, and my bladder does not want me to be great. So... I personally like jumpsuits, but my bladder does not want me to be happy and fly. And so that's why we have compromised and I don't make or wear jumpsuits. However, I've been converted to the Zadie, which is really a nice jumpsuit. And so I was thinking, oh, I should save this for my Zadie. I'm like, well, you could save this for another summer or... You could wear this to this denim and diamond party that you have actually been invited to and you know how you like to dress. So I went ahead and made the dress and it was such a success. It turned out really, really cute. And I felt it was it felt really good to make it because it felt like this fabric that had just been sitting in my collection for more than a year, at least, um, could finally see the light of day. And so that just made me feel pretty good. It made me feel like I was using the stashed, the stashed gem challenge that um, so much talent is talking about. And then thinking about the principle of the challenge itself, that I have a lot of patterns and I have a lot of fabric and it's not really doing me or anybody else any good just to sit on it. It's not going to increase in value because I don't use it. And so when we come back, I'm going to talk a bit more about other ways to use fabrics that are precious and special and can still retain that special and precious feeling for you. Stay tuned. Here at Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, we talk a lot about sewing. But if you want to see and not just hear about some of the things we've been discussing, feel free to join us on the socials. You can find us at Stitch Please on Facebook, and you can also find us on Instagram at Black Women Stitch. You can find photos of projects that we've been working on, really interesting social commentary, and on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can join Black Women Stitch for a live Instagram chat. Again, that's every Thursday at 3 p.m. So find us on the socials, follow up with us. We are happy to hear your direct messages. You can reach out to us at the Black Women Stitch page on Instagram, and we'll help you get your stitch together. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Don't Save It, Just Sew It episode of the Stitch Please podcast. I'm going to talk now about ways that you can take your fabrics that you think are precious and special and preserve them by using them. And so this is something that I was able to do, and I was pretty pleased with how it turned out. And so I've divided the projects into two categories. The first category is more like a home deck kind of category. And I call it a home deck category because what it's actually doing is it's taking the fabrics that you appreciate and that are special to you and it's putting them around your space, your home, your um, your living room, bedroom, even your office in ways that remind you of the memory that that fabric was from. So my first example of this kind of project is to make a picture frame. You can take your fabric 
and you can make a picture frame out of it. And there's two ways to do it. One way is to buy a picture frame from the store and then use decoupage techniques. Like you take, basically you take the picture frame, you cut it in a square, you cut your fabric in a square, and then you cut a rectangular shape out of it, and then you wrap it, almost like you're wrapping a gift, and you use Mod Podge to hold it down. Then you put the back of the picture frame on. Before you put the picture on, you put the wrap the frame, let it dry, put the photo in there, put the back of the picture frame on, and now you have fabric that is, you have the picture frame that is wrapped in the fabric and that's a, and you can put it somewhere in your space where you can see it and you can look at it and it's just, it's really an enjoyable an enjoyable thing i've done this in two ways with stuff that i made for my my youngest kid my youngest child is now a teenager but when he was a baby well, maybe he was a toddler because he could walk. There's two picture frames that I still have right now. And whenever I look at those frames, I remember the project I made for him because I took that exact project and turned it into a picture frame. The first picture, the first project was a, he had this cute little quilted denim outfit. I made him a little jacket and little pants, and he had little boots and a little hat that went with it, and it was just the cutest thing ever. I think I still have the little hat, I think, someplace, but the rest of those things are long gone. But what I did was I took that quilted fabric and I made a picture frame out of the fabric. I did this using almost like a pillow turn technique where I put the fabrics right sides together, I sewed around the edge, I turned it right side out, and then I was able to slide the picture in. And so I know this sounds kind of, I'm making it sound confusing, and I don't mean to. I think maybe I could try to, I think I have photos of this I could show you. But um, and this is why I think YouTube videos are such a good idea for sewing things, <laughs> because I, you know, you could show somebody. But instead, I will just tell you. But um, I used... Um, I took that, basically it's really simple to do, the, the, the top layer of the photo of the picture frame is a square that I then traced a rectangle out of in the size of the photo. I cut out the rectangle in the middle, turned under those raw edges, and stitched them. That left me with an opening of about three by five or two and three quarters by four and uh, and four and three quarters, which was a little bit smaller than a three by five photo, right? So then I took, I think maybe a piece of um, lining fabric or something and put that behind it and stitched that down to make a pocket. Then I put the another piece of the fashion fabric on the back and then installed like ribbons at the top to hang it up. And so now I have a picture of him in this outfit as a baby wearing, or a toddler, as a toddler wearing the fabric that he is, that he has on in the photograph. I did a similar thing with his Halloween costume that year. He was the frog prince. I made this cute little frog outfit, and it had like gold lame, um, Gold, a gold lamé collar with little bells on the end of all the little tuffets. It was just the cutest little thing. And so I was like, well, he's not going to be using that costume again, and we don't have any kids in our family that are about his age. So I just deconstructed the costume, took the little um, bells and th- th- that were attached to the, the trim around the neckline for the costume and put that into the picture frame. So I have a, now I have a picture of him in his toddler frog costume wearing, wearing the exact fabric that the picture frame is made of. So I'm happy to talk more about this on the IG Live on Thursday if people have questions, and I can post photos um, on my Instagram channel, on my Instagram page as well about this. But that's just one example of fabric that was special and precious to me at the time, and I still have it in my office, what now, 14 years later. Um, And so that's pretty, that's that's a really nice thing. Another recommendation I had for taking fabric that's really special and precious and preserving it by using it is to make throw pillows. These are really simple projects. Um, You can use the whole cloth 
piece or you can use just part of it and make a throw pillow. And I would say make a cover um, because with the you could always take the cover off and wash it if you need to and then put it back on. If you want if the if the pillow gets compressed over time and the the filling inside breaks down and you want to switch that out, you can do that. So a throw pillow is another I think really good idea. Um, that way you can have the you can have the throw pillow in your in your living room or on your bed or whatever, and then you get to see it a lot. And that's I think that's one of the great things about the picture frames and the throw pillows that these are things that you can look at and still have the reminders of that fabric that you had and might not want to let go of, but you're also but you're using it. And so I think that's a great idea. The last one I had on this on this particular. Um, mode of using precious fabrics was to make a tuffet. Have you seen these? These are a home deck footstool. Um, Lots of people are offering them, um, offering classes on them. I've seen people make them out of pleather. I've seen them make them out of denim. I'm actually interested in a denim one, actually. That would be really good. Um, but there's lots of different patterns that you can buy um, to make those. And that, I thought, would be another good example because it's a nice statement piece for a room. I think almost any room could benefit from, like, a little stool, a footstool, or sometimes people can just sit on them. And so that could be another um, example. And I can provide links in the show notes to that pattern, at least the one that I have. Or do I have it? No, I have I have two patterns to make a rug out of fabric strips. And that's what I'm confusing with my tuffet pattern that I actually do not have. But um, I can still provide that in the show notes so you can check it out. But it's, it's a nice way to kind of look at your fabric and, you know, feel like it's, I don't know, feel, I don't know. That's something that I really enjoy, for example, about the picture frames. I have one of those picture frames downstairs in our downstairs family room. And then I have one in my office. And I really love going into my office and looking over there and seeing that pic- that picture frame made from that fabric that would have been just long forgotten about. And so I was able to use it and to remind myself of that experience. Um, so the next thing that I think is also really cool um, is to think about ways that you can carry your fabrics with you. Um, what if you think about like if, for example, you are a planner, you have a, a planner or two that you carry, you can make a planner cover out of fabric, and carry that with you. Um, something that I like to do is to make um, binder covers. I love like hardcover notebooks. You can make binder covers out of fabric as well as notebook covers. Another thing is a project I used to make a lot of, and it's called a document duvet. Document duvet, D-U-V-E-T. And I first discovered it in a book by Amy Butler called In Stitches. Now, some of y'all might still have this book, and you can find the project described on page 124. It's called a document duvet and photo file. And basically, you take your fabric, you stiffen it, with um, craft fuse by Pellon, which is a fusible interfacing. And then you sew it together in such a way and you stabilize it by sliding either cardboard or some like um, foam core board in between the layers of the fabric. And it basically makes a really nice, sturdy file folder cover. It's about nine by 11, I believe. So you can put like larger sheets of paper in there, like full sheets. You can make it whatever size you want, actually. But it's just a really cool project. And it's a nice way to use up fabric, especially heavier weight home deck fabrics or denim, and just carry them around with you. You could also change the shape of it to have it um, be like a passport cover. You could do it to do other documents other than um, full paper size documents. And so that's what that's something that I've done. And I used to make a lot of those. But I wanted to recommend that because I do think it's a nice way to take fabrics that, again, that you have and that you want, you really like them, you want to do something with them and you can keep them near you. Or if you're going to a meeting or a workshop or something like that, you can grab that, um, that document duvet and put your papers in there and your account. And it's a really unique way. No one else will have one just like yours. Finally, one thing I wanted to add about this before I close out this segment of the suggestions 
was bookmarks and reading accessories. I really love making bookmarks, and um, I think that that's another way of using pieces of fabric and, you know, and making a bunch of these, giving them as gifts. You could embellish them. You could use embroidery on them, either machine embroidery or hand embroidery. You could do um, heat press vinyl on them, heat transfer vinyl. There's lots of things that you could do with bookmarks, but I do like that as a way to remind yourself of a particular, you know, fabric. And that's something I've been doing as well, as well as making these things with rubber bands. Um, And like I make a little pocket and I could put pens or highlighters in it. And then I also attach the, the elastic through that little pocket and wrap it around the whole book. And because I'm a professor and I, I do, I do hate to admit this, but I do write in the books that I read, not library books, my own personal books. I do write in them and make notes and highlighters and stuff. So it's always nice to have a highlighter or a pen or pencil close by. And if I make this little pencil pouch, then I can do that and I can move it from one book to another. And that's another way to use special fabrics. When we come back, we'll talk more about some ways that you can enhance your sewing space and use fabrics that you love. Stay tuned. Hello, Stitchers. We have a limited edition opportunity for you to support the Stitch Please podcast and the Black Women Stitch project as a whole and get some more fabric in your collection. These are mystery fabric boxes of fabrics that have been divided into woven and knit. There's boxes that that are stuffed with black and white fabrics. There's boxes of chevron fabrics. There's boxes of fabrics called, I think, adventure or nature or something like that. Um, And these are completely full of fabrics. These are medium flat rate USPS boxes that can be sent directly to you for $30. And that shipping is included. So if you're interested in building your stash or um, taking a chance on some really cool fabrics, let me know. You can DM me on Instagram at Black Women Stitch, or you can send me an email at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com, and we will send you a mystery box of very cool fabrics, $30, shipping and insurance included. And that'll help you get your stitch together too. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to today's episode of the Stitch Please podcast. We are talking about don't save it, just sew it. And I wanted to share with you in this last segment a bit about some of the things that I have made for my sewing room out of fabrics that I considered special and precious. The purpose of today's episode is to talk about ways to preserve fabrics that we think are special or that are meaningful to us and use them at the same time. That for me, my goal is to help these fabrics see the light of day to get them out of the drawers and closets in which I have them stored so that I can enjoy them in that way. And so one of the first things I wanted to share is a very, very simple way to do this is to take a piece of that very special fabric that you have and cut it into a four, five, six inch circle and put it in a hand embroidery hoop. That's it. That's the tweet. You take that piece of fabric, you put it in an embroidery hoop, and then you hang that embroidery hoop somewhere in your sewing room. And one of the things I like about that is that it's a way to preserve whichever size of fabric that you want. You could have it be small. You could kind of trace out a particular motif on the fabric that you want it to keep. And it doesn't really matter because you're doing it for your own memory, your own edification, your own pleasure. It doesn't have to appeal to anybody else. It just speaks to you. And so that's something I really like about if you've had fabrics that you um, really care about and you want to do something with them, this is a nice little memory technique to do. And it doesn't require any sewing at all. It does require cutting that fabric, which can sometimes be a big leap. But once you've done that, you can put it on your wall. And whenever you walk into your sewing space, 
you get to see it and appreciate it. And that's the purpose of this whole episode is that you can take these fabrics. You don't have to save it. You can sew it. You can do something with it in a way that furthers your appreciation for it. So that's one simple idea. Another idea that's like way more complicated because I am the uh, captain of Team Do Too Much is that you can take your fabrics and your scraps, which is something I have been working on for quite a while, and make little tiny, I'm not sure what to even call it, but what I have done is I have done two things that help me refer to or remember projects that I've made that I really like. The first thing I've done is that I have preserved the selvages from some of the woven fabrics that I've used for apparel and quilt projects. So I cut the selvages off the fabric, especially if they're really cool selvages. You know, I think um, Rashida Coleman Hale has some really great selvages. Um, a lot of these um, really cool high end uh, quilt fabrics have really pretty selvages that have different colors, that have different messages. And so I cut all those off and I put them all in a bag and they are hanging in a giant two gallon clear Ziploc bag on a wall in my sewing room. And so whenever I have a woven project that has a cool salvage, I put it in there. Now, what I'm going to do with these salvages one day is that I'm going to either sew them all together and make a bag or a chair cover or a jacket, probably not a jacket, but I've seen people make jackets. Um, but each of the selvages is a remnant that reminds me of the fabric itself. And so that's something that I was really thinking about. I was thinking like, well, what if I took it and did it like per year? Like, okay, these are all the fabric pieces that I used in, you know, 2017. And I have put them all together to make, I don't know, I have no idea, but you said, I don't know, a pin cushion, who knows? But right now, all those little selvages are in that bag, and um, I think they would make a really cool project at some point. Hopefully, I don't have them in there so long that I totally forget that I was even saving them, because I know that I know that some places now, um, I believe, I forgot which company, but one of the companies actually sells yardage of fabric that looks like selvages because people are so interested in keeping their selvages for quilt projects. Another far more elaborate project that I'm doing is something that I really am in love with. And maybe this will be the picture that I use for the episode is that when I make a dress or a shirt for my husband or for my kids, I save a piece of the fabric so I can then make a paper pieced quilt block of a shirt or a blouse or a dress. And so, so far, I haven't, I, I have not been able to keep up with the number of dresses that I've made and have them match the number of quilt blocks. Some of the quilt blocks, some of them won't be suitable for a, quilt, for a quilt block because I do a lot of apparel sewing out of knits and synthetic knit fabrics. But for those pieces that I make out of woven, I definitely plan to keep going with the quilt blocks that I've been making. So I purchased... Um, some really cool paper pieced vintage style dress patterns, as well as some cool men's shirts patterns, short sleeved only is the only ones I've been able to find so far. And I'm going to make my husband a shirt. I save the fabric so I can then make him a quilt block, make a quilt block of a shirt. And so I'm hoping at some point, maybe long after those garments have gone off to Goodwill or we've We've given them out through um, another kind of giving program, and I could talk a bit about those in a second, but what we do to give away things here. Um, I'll still have that memory. I'll still have that quilt, you know, and I can say, oh, I remember that shirt I made for you. 
Funny side note is that my husband does a really great job of holding on to things that I've made. So like he has this shirt that I made when the kids were like doggone babies. And of course the thing still fits, but mine is long gone. I have no idea where it is, but he still has his. And I'm like, that's amazing. Um, I think just recently he threw away some pajamas that I made for him when we first got married. And that was like over 20 years ago. And he's wearing these like poor, like, you know, the seams are all coming apart, you know, from all the washing and the laundering and stuff. So he does a good job of holding on to his things. Me, I'm more of a, that's enough. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, but yes, so that's just, an, I'm really excited about that quilt coming together. And again, there's no deadline on the project, but it's a nice bit of documentary evidence. Um, and I really do like that as a, like a nice little, I don't know, a little memory marker. Um, the last couple of things are about the sewing room itself. And here's two things that I've done that I also really like. One of them is to make a, you can make a little, you can make baskets out of fabric. And these baskets you can use to put um, little notions in, little pins and things like that to decorate your sewing space. And then there's also something that I've made that I absolutely love and use every single time I sit down to sew. I use this. It's, I call it a sewing machine apron. I don't know if it's actually called that, but this is a thing that goes under your sewing machine. I made mine to fit my sewing machine, which is a Baby Lock Unity, which is a pretty big machine. And it has all these pockets that I put on. I also put on some clear parts so I could kind of see things. It um, has double layers of pockets, but all it's like basically like a sewing notions caddy or a sewing machine caddy. And I, I mentioned this because I've seen a pattern for it. I believe it's Simplicity. That's so Monica is doing this month in January of 2020 for the, um, the project. What's her project called? Uh, so Your View. The So Your View project for January is making this um, project. And so I wanted to mention that because, you know, I'll put that in the show notes in case you wanted a pattern to make one. But I made mine myself, just kind of designed like what I wanted. I made some thin t- to put like pencils in. I have it to put a whole bunch of other sewing notions. And they're basically all absolutely on board. So when I am sewing and I need some tweezers, it's there. I need some chapstick, it's there. Um, I need a, I need a pencil sharpener, it's on there. All of the things that I would use for sewing, you know, a point turner, thread snips, all of those things live right there. Hand lotion, all of them live right there in the sewing machine caddy. And I use this fabric that I absolutely loved. It's sewing machine themed. I have not, it's red and white. I have not been able to find it since. And this is another great example, I thought, of using what I loved and not just saving it because I loved it. So hopefully you all have gotten a few good ideas about how you can use the fabrics that you love so that you don't have to save it. You can just sew it and you can still show your love for that fabric. I'm happy to talk more about this on the live this Thursday at 3 p.m. on Black Women Stitch. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. There are a variety of ways that you can support the program, and you're doing it right now. By listening to the, pro- by listening to the podcast, it does help us grow. Another way to do that is to rate the podcast, review it, subscribe to it. All of these things are ways that you can support the podcast without having to spend any money at all. If you would like to spend some money to support us, there are ways to do that as well. You can make direct donations to our Patreon site for monthly contributions, as well as one-time contributions to PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo. And finally, we have another cute, very adorable way for you to support the Black Women's Stitch Project. It's a pin, a P-I-N enamel lapel pin that's very cute. It's about two inches wide and one and a half inch tall, and it's of the Black Women's Stitch logo. And that is $15 with free shipping to the U.S. And so if you drop $15 in the uh, PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App accounts, and then send me your email, no, not email, if you send me your mailing address to my email either at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com 
or you send me a direct message on the Black Women's Stitch Instagram page, we will put the pin in the mail to you. Um, again, free shipping, $15 for the pin, and all of this goes to support the Black Women's Stitch Project. Thank you again for joining us this week. Come back next week and we will help you get your stitch together. Stitch together.